Welcome to the Dog Nation Happy Hour, presented by Marlowe's Tavern. A fun and laid-back look at everything happening around the Georgia Bulldogs and the latest UGA recruiting news there as well. Make sure you stop by the local Marlowe's Tavern right there in your neighborhood and enjoy happy hour every weekday from 4 to 6 p.m. And now, for Dog Nation Happy Hour, here's your host, Kaylee Manziel. Hello and welcome into Dog Nation Happy Hour. I am not Kaylee Manzel. My name is Connor Riley. I'm filling in this week, pinch hitting as Kaylee is helping out with some local high school coverage. Uh, and so today it'll be just the two college guys in Athens, although Mike is technically not really in Athens. He's in a county county. And yes, there is a difference. Uh, I'm joined today by Mike Griffith for this Dog Nation Happy Hour brought to you by Marlowe's. Happy Hour is that magical time you get to unwind, relax and treat yourself to some well-deserved specials. While we have our to-go favorites at Marlowe's Tavern, it's fun to mix it up with the happy hour menu. And you might be asking yourself, what is happy hour without a tasty beverage? Be sure to try Marlowe's Tropical Blue, the combination of bare bones vodka, sweet pineapple juice, blue curacao, savory coconut puree, and lime juice make you feel like you're at the beach. Uh, of course, you can always opt for some fan favorites on our Marlowe's happy hour menu staples. There are always the crunching crispy kettle chips. Or you can savor some of the firecracker deviled eggs that just sound delicious, that have just the right kick to them with a firecracker sauce. And there's also the hot chicken sandwiches that I'm sure Mike Griffith would be a very big fan of given his time in Nashville. Uh, although, you know, with the construction going on at Vanderbilt, I'm not sure, you know, what, what it'll look like when Georgia heads up there in the middle of October. But without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and dive into this happy hour. Uh, Georgia finishing its first Preseason scrimmage this past Friday. They've got their second one coming up this Saturday, and those are both on Saturday. I don't know why I said Friday there. It's a little loose here on Dog Nation Happy Hour. And so, Mike, you were at the press conference this past Saturday. You'll be there again this coming Saturday. Been to a few practices so far. I think we're officially past the halfway point of uh, fall camp. What have been your big takeaways so far? Yeah, it's interesting, Connor. Kirby actually told us that they actually did a little scrimmage in Friday. I mean, in addition to Saturday, which, you know, my goodness, it's, a, you know, there's a 106 degree heat index. And, you know, someone told me on the field, it was more like 125. And that's not an exaggeration. There is no air on that field. So those guys were in a pressure cooker, uh, you know, no pun intended, like never before. And the head coach was not happy. The head coach was riding everybody's ass. He was taught calling out assistant coaches, calling out players, didn't want hands on hips. I mean, Kirby on a rampage, which which is par for the course. But I, I think there are some concerns. And, you know, what stands out for me, even though we knew that the quarterbacks were going to, you know, there would probably be more than one playing early in the year. I, I'm surprised that there hasn't been more of Carson back, you know, taking charge. Like, I know he had a good offseason. I mean, my goodness, he even cut his hair short. That means something if you're Carson Beck and you cut your hair short. You're making you're making the attempt. You're showing the coach, look, I'm all in. I cut my hair, and and yet he's not grabbed it to the extent that I thought he would. And and one of the little telltale quotes that I wouldn't say bothered me, but maybe kind of raised made me raise an eyebrow. When we think about Carson Beck and why he is the guy who will start the season, it's because he knows the offense the best. It's because. Georgia can do more with Carson on the field. That's what he brings with all this experience and the majority of all the playing time. And yet Kirby was talking about cutting the offense back. And to me, I was like, uh Oh, you know, that's not a good sign for Carson back that they feel like they need to cut some things back. Now, obviously you got to cut some things, back, but that the fact that he chose to talk about it, the fact that he chose to say, you know, all three of the quarterbacks could have been better. The fact that he deflected a question about Carson Beck into talking about all three, trying to read the tea leaves. I do think there's a competition. I really do. I think it's genuine. I think Carson's going to start. I think as long as Carson plays well in the games, I think he's going to be the guy, but I just don't feel like Connor that it's as, de as decided as it was last year when it was Stetson the year before when it was JT maybe the sort of same sort of uncertainty we had in 2020 when Dwan started because JT wasn't really ready and Newman had flown the coop, but it, it just feels a little more unsettled. And you've had your hand on the, you know, you've, you've got your finger on the pulse of this as well. I guess I would ask you your thoughts, you know, about that quarterback situation that we seem to be talking about a little bit more and more as we get deeper into fall camp. 
Yeah, I, I think when Georgia opens the season against UT Martin, you're going to see Carson Beck and Brock Vandegrift there play in the first half. Uh, by some of the accounts that I've heard, it sounds like Brock Vandegrift has had a good fall camp and made positive strides that you want to see him make uh, as he elected to stay this spring. And I think that was big for him. Gunnar Stockton has played well as well there. But I, I think the big thing with Brock Vandergriff, and I don't think this is something that can be overlooked, is his mobility. And again, you know, it's not to say that Carson Beck isn't a, 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 a capable athlete, but his legs are not the same, I, I think, difference maker that uh, Brock Vandergriff potentially could be and that Stetson Bennett's were – uh, for these past two seasons. And we know from that 2021 quarterback decision that Kirby Smart made throughout the year, Stetson's mobility was a big reason why he ended up winning that job, along with the fact that he won over his teammates there. And so I, I think Georgia rightfully so wants to get into game situations where they see what Brock Vandergriff's legs can do for him. Uh, and I will say the concerns at the running back position, A, have really only grown since fall camp have started. But, you know, if Georgia's not going to have capable running backs, guys that are going to be difference makers, uh, I think you're going to see them maybe lean on that quarterback run game a little bit more. They did that with Stetson a season ago. And I think that was a big reason why, especially in the big games against Ohio State, against Tennessee, LSU in the SEC championship game, they were willing to use his legs in that situation. And now with Georgia, maybe a little bit deeper at the quarterback position when you do have Carson and you do have Gunner and you do have Brock there as well. You know, I don't want to call Brock maybe potentially a gadget player, but with what he can do with his legs, I do think that's something to watch, especially given the early part of the schedule where you do have UT Martin and you do have Ball State to start things off. And then another game after the South Carolina game against UAB, who might be one of the worst teams in all of group of five. And so I think, you know, Georgia's going to take its time with this quarterback decision. Uh, I'm maybe not as alarmed as Mike is with the Carson Beck stuff. We were never, ever, there's no world where we were going to hear that, you know, Carson Beck is lighting the world on fire and has locked up the quarterback one job. Kirby Smart was never going to let that happen. Uh, and so, you know, he was hurt by drops during the scrimmage. I, I think that was one of the more interesting things because we've talked about the wide receiver position being such a strength. And so to hear that uh, was certainly interesting there, but I, you know, I think when it comes to the quarterback position, look, you know, we can sit here and talk about it for so much, but the, the biggest thing is Carson Beck's never started a game before Brock Van Gruff's never completed a pass before, uh, you know, as much as we sit here and talk about high performance scrimmages and how they practice, I, I think the big thing moving forward is just you have to go out there and see them in a game and, and see how they do and develop over the course of that season. And so as frustrating as that can be, because it is the middle of August, uh, that's sort of what we're waiting on now uh, as Georgia sort of makes its way through its first scrimmage at another practice uh today on thursday when this will be airing and so you know i i expect the second scrimmage i expect the offense to probably play a little bit better that's sort of how scrimmages go first one the defense always seems to be a little bit ahead and then as the season progresses the offense gets better i think you saw that with georgia last year or, you know yes they started fast against oregon but the offense that in the lsu game in the tennessee game and or and then obviously in the college football playoff against Ohio State and TCU, I thought that the offense really came along. And quite frankly, I expect a similar trajectory this year where maybe the defense starts out fast. And then over the course of the season, this offense sort of finds its legs with whoever the quarterback ultimately is there. Yeah. And, and, and I'm of the mindset, Connor, that if that if they were opening with the Clemson or an Oregon, that Kirby Smart would be managing this differently. There'd be a different approach to it. But look, Kirby, Kirby is a really smart coach because he plays the hands that he's dealt. And he doesn't rush anything. If there's no reason to make a decision on a day, he's not going to make a decision on it today. And when you open with UT Martin, followed by Ball State, not a trip to Oklahoma. I mean, even if there was a trip to Oklahoma in week two, this would be managed differently. But this affords him the chance to really let this competition play out. And like Connor said, really take an extended look of how does Georgia look with a more mobile quarterback? You know, and again, it's not that that, that Beck is some statue, but he's not the runner that Vandergriff or Gunnar Stockton, both of these guys can really hurt you with their legs, like Stetson. Maybe even maybe even more so, because you didn't really want to Stetson's a little guy. You really you didn't want him, you didn't want to see too much, you know. You had to really pick your spots. And I thought Stetson did a really good job picking his spots last year. I think Munkin did as well. And and now Munkin's not here. I, I really think that Munkin leaving was probably more detrimental to Carson Beck than the other two quarterbacks because Munkin had brought Carson along. I feel like with Munkin, there was probably a little bit more of a of a, a orientation towards pass. And not saying that Boba doesn't want to throw it. We've heard Aaron Murray that say that that Boba loves to throw the you know what out of it. 
but I feel like Munkin probably would have done some things to create a little bit more in the past game. Whereas I feel like Bobo is going to probably do more with, with the personnel and kind of brings up a really good point uh, about the running backs and the fact that Kendall Milton hasn't gotten healthy. The fact that Branson Robinson was still kind of waiting. He was held out of the scrimmage. The fact that Kirby said, Andrew Paul still got to get more confidence back in his knee. Um, those are three frontline players, you know, and, as much as we've heard about Cash Jones, you know, he's he's a former walk-on. I, I just don't think you can expect a Stetson Bennett to emerge at every position and play great from walk-on status. I mean, uh, and then Rod Robinson, I, I think I'm excited about this guy, but power football. I see more power. I don't see the back coming out of the backfield, catching the ball 15, 30 yards downfield like Kenny McIntosh and James Cook did. I don't think the backfield is going to be as multidimensional to Connor's point. Now, Connor, I'll throw this out there. That means other people do have to pick up that slack. And obviously now you've got a guy that can operate out of the slot with love it. But I look at Lad McConkey. Like if you're asking me who's going to have the most yards last from scrimmage, you know, because Lad had punts. But I would be willing to say right now, I'm going to throw this out there. I think you're going to disagree with me. I think Lad McConkey is going to have more yards receiving than Brock Bowers this year. What say you – on distribution and yardage and skill position players this year. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, practice on Tuesday, we saw Georgia, you know, running some swing passes out of the backfield of Brock Bowers. And I wonder with some of the running back issues that they have, maybe they get creative and they throw him back there. Uh, you know, it, we'll be interested to see how sort of balanced they are in terms of leaning on Brock, because I think you saw certainly during the course of the last season, Look, if Brock Bowers wanted to have 150 yards receiving every game and 10 catches, he absolutely could, and he's good enough to do so. But I, I think Georgia didn't want to lean on him that way uh, and run the risk of injury. And you sort of see, you know, for example, the 2021 Alabama team where they leaned so heavily on uh, Jamison Williams and John Mechie, and they just weren't able to hold up over the course of the season because of the wear and tear that they had had there. Uh, you know, Brock has been more durable than Lad McConkey. I think that is something to watch and will be interesting this season to sort of see how they go about using Lad because there were times last year where he wore down, I think, over the course of the season. But Lad's absolutely a difference maker. Uh, it would not surprise me. I think one of, you know, the fact that Georgia has, I think, Lad McConkey, Brock Bowers, and, and Dominic Lovett as three guys who can all sort of lead Georgia in receiving realistically, I, I think sort of speaks to the depth of this passing game. And what you're going to see there. I still think it's going to be Brock Bowers. I think, you know, there's going to be a push to really let Brock loose maybe a little bit more than we've seen in the past couple of years. And I'll, I'll say this, look, there's been two uh, thousand yard receivers in Georgia football history. It, the only reason I think Brock doesn't get there is because either a Georgia doesn't want him to, or because they start using him more as a running back and what he might be able to do there. But I did take note of that yesterday, especially with the fact that look, other than cash Jones, a walk on that's impressed this season, uh, or this this you know spring and now fall, they don't really have a capable pass catcher in that running back position. And I think that they're going to be willing to get creative and use Brock in that way to get him some more touches and to use him as a running back to try and freak out uh, opposing defenses, which you should be. If Georgia's doing something unique and creative with Brock Bowers, which we've seen over the last two seasons, uh, it usually tends to be pretty good for Georgia and pretty bad for the opposing team. So I, I think, you know, while Ladd is certainly a good answer, I'm really interested in sort of seeing the next level uh, and development of, of a Brock Bowers and sort of where things go with him there. Uh, changing it up here a little bit, Mike, again, we're past the halfway of fall camp. Who is a player that has impressed you or, you know, has caught your eye maybe more than you thought they were going to? Well, I mean, I'm going to go back to Lad real quick and part of my theory, and, and he is one of the guys that, you were at that press conference where it, it looked like he had like one of those muscles, like somebody inflated air under his shirt. It was like, who is this guy? It's like Lad McConkey's head on top of somebody else's body. I mean, he is so, his upper body is so developed. You can, you know, I think he's up to 190. Like, like Lad is obviously put on a coat of a suit of armor for this season in anticipation to, you know, a being maybe more durable. So he's not as likely to wear down. I mean, it'll be interesting to see if they use him in the return game because I'm hearing all sorts of great things of, of McHugh Muse. That's actually a guy that I like. I'm like, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I think Muse is going to be the return guy. And I think he's going to do things in the pass game. I think this is going to be a guy you can get the ball out too quickly in space that can do some things. This, this to me is your walk on success story of the year. 
I, I, again, I, I just, I, I hate, you know, I, I know Cash Jones is good things. I just, I just don't know because that running back backfield is so deep. I just don't know if I can really put my brain thinking that Cash Jones is going to be an eight to 10 touch player every game when you got guys back there like Andrew Paul and Rod Robinson and Branson Robinson will be back soon and Dejon Edwards. I just don't know if I can wrap my brain around that guy taking snaps away from those scholarship backs as much as I can a guy like Muse who wins the coach over playing on special teams and and all he does is make plays. I mean, we saw it in the G day game. So that's, that's kind of been a guy, Aaron Smith, you know, Aaron really stepped forward. I was watching the Ohio state replay the other night and I forgot he really made two big catches, not just one, he had another really big catch. And, and the fact that Kirby put him out there for us on day one of media, you know, we have to kind of read the tea leaves, like who's Kirby sending out there, right? Like that's him telegraphing, like, you know, beep, 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 beep. This guy's doing a good job. You know, I'm sending him out there to the media. Or I like the, like the way he interviews, right? We were joking about, you know, Oscar Delp maybe being the next John Fitzpatrick, albeit I think Oscar's a little bit more colorful. And uh, I thought Oscar had a heck of a, a, a press conference debut, Connor, on a, on a scale of one to 10. I would give him an eight. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to take a little off, a little off track here just for a fun moment. I want you to give me your top three Georgia interview guys right now. If you could, for whatever, you know, color, um, you know, as far as what they can tell us about the team. If I said, Connor, if you can pick the three guys that we're going to get to talk to every single week, who would you want? The, and, and I'm going to take quarterback out of it because that's an obvious one. We always want the quarterback. Who would be your three Georgia players that you would want to interview every week? Uh, I think Zion Logue is definitely one of those guys. Javon Bullard is one of those guys for me. Um, and I probably need an offensive player to fill this list out. Uh, I will say Marcus Rosemey Jackson. I, I think he gives some pretty colorful uh, descriptions. We heard a few of those on Tuesday night when he got a chance to talk to him there. Uh, and, and I think he's a good guy to, to sort of ask questions about. I could easily say Cedric Van Pran as well, but uh, and unfortunately I think offensive linemen sort of don't have the same level of color uh, that some of the other guys have. But there are a lot of really good speakers, I think, on this Georgia team. I think Zion Lowe uh, is one of the more honest guys on this team. and He will give you his honest opinion, and, and he is not afraid to, to let it be known. Javon Bullard is a guy who every time we speak with him, I come away more and more impressed. And it seems like, you know, not that they're actively trying to do this because they have so much other stuff to focus on, but it seems like he gets better and better at speaking to the media each time we hear from him. And and he's a real joy. uh, And I'm glad we get to hear from there are a couple of sophomores who I'll be interested in seeing when we hear from them in particular, Malachi Starks and Jalen Walker. Uh, I got a chance to talk to those guys during the college football playoff run last year and, and came away impressed and, and eager to hear from them I, I i will say sort of transitioning back to my original question i asked mike you know who's impressing him so far and he he let off with two walk-ons uh did not expect him to go in that direction uh i, I will say getting a watch practice and this is a follow file it away nugget uh getting a watch practice on, on tuesday uh Georgia's got two really good freshman cornerbacks. And yes, Chris Peel is dealing with some turf toe right now. That's why he wasn't at practice this week. But A.J. Harris is going to be a really good player for this team. I was impressed with what he was doing uh, and watching him go through some drill drill work. He looks like an SEC cornerback already. And the fact that he does that as a freshman, I think speaks to just, you know, what Georgia, Georgia sort of looks for now and gets in terms of, recruiting players this isn't you know uh eric stokes having a red shirt a year to sort of get ready for the sec these guys are coming in ready-made products uh, daniel harris this guy is impossibly long he's got i think the longest arms in that cornerback room and he's got to put on some weight uh but the fact that this georgia cornerback room uh is as deep as it is and it's only going to continue to get deeper with adding ellis robinson next year who might be as good as any cornerback prospect georgia has landed at, at from a recruiting standpoint uh, I think this cornerback room is going to be really, 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 really good going forward. And, and given that, you know, the teams that have traditionally given Georgia trouble of late have had really great wide receivers and really great quarterbacks. Uh, the fact that this cornerback room is leveling up in the way that it has, uh, you know, I think if there were a weakness on that 2021 team it was probably the cornerback position and to see where Georgia has gone with that position now and moving forward, I think that it just speaks to, you know, how Kirby identifies issues and ways his teams might be beat and where things go from there. And so I think that cornerback position is something I really came away impressed with at practice this week. As far as a player, 
In particular, uh, you know, Oscar Delp is a guy we heard from this week. And, you know, look, it's not easy to go from 225 as a freshman to 245 uh, and what he is playing at now. And he's going to have, I think, a really interesting role this year. Uh, I'll be intrigued to see how much he's used in the past game because what we've heard so far is just how much he's able to do as a run blocker. And coming out of high school, this guy was primarily a pass catcher. And so I'll be interested in seeing how he sort of gets sprinkled in and used in the offense in that manner. Yeah, no doubt this is another, going to be another example of, of how Georgia develops players. And, and and this is a guy they rode really hard. I mean, Oscar Delp heard his name a lot over the speaker. He he was, you know, called out a lot for the blocking. I mean, Kirby leans – when Kirby leans on you like that, it, it's, it, it sounds strange, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes if Kirby's calling your name a lot, it's a good thing because he's pushing you, he sees something, he wants something out of you. Right now, if you don't respond, it's a bad thing, Eric Gilbert. But if you are able to develop, well, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, there, there, some people were able to adapt to. I mean, this place, and Connor, you know it. Like this place ain't for everybody. It it is rigid, it is structured, and it just requires nth degree every single day. And there's just no margin for error. And and even when you're playing well, I remember. Kobe Dean telling us that story about, you know, how he was kind of having a practice that, you know, wasn't his best. And Kirby went up to him and said, oh, man, you you know, kind of tired. You, you study. Yeah, I was up to Kirby said, yeah, nobody cares. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. You may have a very good reason. Nobody cares. It, your good reason. Tyke Smith. Remember poor Tyke Smith? This guy's coming off the knee. And, and he's out there barking at him that one scrim because he's not. And, and we t- asked Tyke about it. He's like, yeah, that was me, man. I had to. I had to get up to speed. I had to adjust. I mean, it's just, it's a results oriented business because if Georgia doesn't win the title, it's crazy. I ran this, this survey, this poll, it won't be a good season for Georgia unless 25% of the people, 1600 votes, 25% said if Georgia doesn't win a national championship, it's not a good season. Are you kidding me? 47% Connor said that if Georgia doesn't play for the national title, it's not a good season. 87% said if Georgia's not in the 14 playoff, it's not. It's almost 9 out of 10. It's not a good season. Do you know how many things? You do know how many things. We've written about it. We've documented it. How many things have to go right? Now, I will say this. This year's schedule, is, is it's not a great one. It's not Georgia's fault. It's well documented. But I think Peter Burns made a really good point the other night. And I don't see Georgia is past the point of being judged on his regular season. Yeah, the regular season sucks, but the, who cares? Or the regular season schedule sucks, but who cares? It's about winning a championship. Georgia has reached the point now where it's pass fail. And, and the poll kind of indicate, did you win the title or not? I would say Georgia. I would say Alabama. I would say Clemson was there not too long ago. Connor, are there any other teams when we talk about pass fail, championship or not? Who are some of those teams that maybe we ought to include or pass fail college football playoff or not? Would you put maybe USC in there? Is Florida State there yet? Who are on your pass fail list? No, Florida State's not there yet. They've got to, you know, they've got to prove that they can win the ACC first. I, I, I think this year in particular, I think Michigan is on there with what we've heard from Jim Harbaugh and the fact like, look, they've made the college football playoff the last two years. Georgia's the only other program program that can say that. And, and you know, we've heard so much talk this offseason about how talented this Michigan team is. I think it's time to actually go out there and show it. Uh I would say similarly, I think Ohio State, uh, you know, it, it, it's been nine years since they won a national title. And, and that, you know, it certainly starts to grow and get longer away from that. And I, I will say this, like, I think the, you know, Brian Day is not going to get fired if they go 11-1 and one, lose to Michigan this season. But if they go 11-1 and one and miss the playoff, uh, there's going to be some pressure on Ryan Day. Because again, I think similarly to sort of what Georgia is, you know, for Ohio State this year, it's a one-game season where you beat Miss. Because I mean, now maybe Penn State finds a way to upset them. I think Penn State is maybe a team that shouldn't be overlooked, but again, they've got to prove it first to me. Um, you know, let's say Ohio State does find a way to beat Penn State. It, it's a one-game season for Ohio State. They beat Michigan. They're going to beat whoever comes out of the SEC West or the uh, the Big Ten West, and then they're going to be in the playoff. And and then from there, you know, if you get in the playoff, it all comes down to matchups. Georgia similarly. 
I think the season comes down to the SEC championship game. Uh, you know, you're going to be playing probably either a really talented Alabama or LSU, maybe Texas a and finds a way to squeak in there. Uh, but that's sort of how the season just now happens to set up. And so I think those two teams, Michigan and Ohio State, come in there. As far as playoff or bust, I think USC is maybe in there, uh, just given, you know, this is Caleb Williams last year. He's a really talented player. Uh, you don't let players like that leave without getting the absolute most out of your team in that situation. And what they're going to have to replace him next year. And sure, you know, Lincoln Raleigh has always had a great quarterback. Uh, I, I think, to, you know, to not go to the college football, football playoff with three years of having Caleb Williams as your quarterback, because he was, the, they were together there at Oklahoma in 2021. Uh, I, I think that would be sort of a blemish on Lincoln Riley there. Um, you know, I, I think Dabo and Clemson, I, I think this is a really big season for them. I may be a little bit higher on them than some other people, but you know, there are a lot of people that really like Florida state that are ranked ahead of them in the AP poll. And, and so I, I think, you know, if this is another season where Clemson struggles offensively, they brought in Garrett Riley from TCU if they go, you know, 10 and three or, or 10 and two and something like that. And sure they win the ACC, but they don't get in the college football playoff. Uh, we're going to get farther and farther away from when Clemson was, you know, on the same level as where Georgia is now, you know, creeping up on Alabama, being in the discussion of, you know, has Dabo passed, uh, you know, Nick Saban in terms of, you know, not obviously career prestige, but in the moment, you know, who would you rather have as your coach? And so I think that's a team that is probably similarly under some pressure going into this season. All right. Uh, transitioning here, let's do a little rapid fire back and forth. We'll do some NFL here. Obviously preseason action has started. Uh, Mike, who is the former Georgia Bulldog or, you know, we don't have to limit this to just preseason uh, game action. We can do entire camps. Who is the Bulldog that has impressed you the most uh, this preseason and along the NFL ranks? Oh boy. There's so many of these guys that are standing out. Hey, Jalen Carter. I mean, Jalen, and, and, and it, look, he only had two snaps the other night. And on one of them, he hits the quarterback. I mean, you knew that Jalen Carter was going to be kind of a boomer bust kind of guy. And, and I was always on the boom side. I, I think you were too, Connor. I know that the, when we were at the combine, a lot of these NFL types, you know, were trying to take the narrative and run with it. It's pretty well documented that Jalen had some off field issues at Georgia. But at the end of the day, the guy loves football. That's the one thing we know. Even his combine workout, when like, oh, he was out of shape. I saw him run like a 15 yard shuttle run. I, I like, I didn't think like he had just like blown up and turned into some tubby guy. You know um, I thought he was a steal at nine. And I thought I even said before the draft, I said, if the Eagles get Jalen Carter, just give him the Super Bowl Now just get if it's, and then they get Nolan Smith and Keely. I'm like, okay, this is just stupid. And, and I cornered their GM and I really wish I would have done it on video now, but I, I taped it and we did an interview uh, with Howie Rout, their, their GM, about Georgia players. And he's like, they do it right. They've got character. He said all this the day before, you know, all the Carter stuff came down. I'm impressed with Jalen Carter. I'm I'm just, I think that he has gone in there with the right attitude. I think that having Jordan Davis and N'Kobe and Nolan Smith there, I think mean, Nolan, Nolan is blowing up camp. They love Nolan. We love Nolan. They've got Nolan like, on steroids up there. I mean, in terms of his interviews, I mean, he is just cutting loose. He is saying all sorts of stuff. And you're just like, wow, this guy makes me want to play football again. I mean, he's so motivational. So I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go defensively. It has been Jalen Carter. Offensively, I got a 1A and a 1B. The 1A was Kenny. Kenny McIntosh was, had moved up the depth chart and passed Zach Charbonnet. And with the injury, to Kenneth Walker, Kenny was actually looking like he he was getting one reps. Now Walker's going to come back and be their guy, but it looked like Kenny had moved into that number two spot ahead of Zach Charbonnet, which didn't surprise the senior bull executive director, Jim Nagy, because he had him rated ahead of Zach Charbonnet, who was also at the senior bowl. Now why Charbonnet went in the second round and Kenny went in the sixth or sixth round at 40 time. I, to me, there's more, there's more to, I don't know what it is. One, a character thing, but there started to be a deal. I think sometimes when players drop, and they drop so far, people start wondering, is there more to the story? Kenny McIntosh was having a great – he sprained his knee, okay? Long story short. You're going to see him. He's going to be Seattle's third down back. 1B, can't help it, Stetson Bennett. And, and I know he almost threw a pick six on the first play. I know there were a couple other bad throws and bad moments. But there were good moments. There were moments where he showed you the ability to extend the plays. There were moments where he made some really good passes. Yeah, there were some bad moments. Yeah, they lost the game. Yeah, he got sacked three times. But 
he showed enough spark. And then after the game, preseason game, in the press conference, Connor, Stetson had command of the room like like he was a sixth-year NFL quarterback. Like that did not look like a rookie standing up there who was just glad to be there. Like I'm like, this guy's 25 going on 39. I mean, it, the, the poise, and I just thought to myself, and I kind of – kind of smiled inward, you know, and you did the same interviews, you know, first steps was kind of awkward in interview. He didn't, he wasn't really sure what to say. And, you know, he'd start saying something, he'd stop. And you could just feel like the hand of Munkin, the, you know, Kirby's ear to the ground. And you just, you just knew there was more that he wanted to say. And after the Los Angeles game, he said it, he just completely at peace, matured, handled the moment. Now, I don't know if he'll ever start a game. But what I saw him do in that preseason game and the plays that he made, I said, you know what? I The spark is there, and he has gotten better. So those are the three guys. I know you asked me for one. I kind of cheated there. But I've, I've been impressed with those three guys. Jalen Carr, he's going to be a monster. He's going to be. If there's a defensive fantasy football, draft him. And then Kenny and Stetson. Kenny's going to get some reps. I'm not saying to draft him on your fantasy team. But he's going to get on deck. If he gets bigger, faster, stronger – He's got a chance to be something in the NFL, you know, maybe a frontline guy. And then Stetson's, there's still hope for Stet. He may not be number two today. They may not be ready to hand him the ball yet. But when you see that kind of playmaking, that's a guy that you keep around and say, you know what, if this guy puts it all together, maybe he's like a miniature Brett Favre. Let's throw that. Miniature Brett Favre. Brett Favre, three-time NFL MVP. Uh, big Miniature. Shoes. Miniature. <laughs> Uh, my answer is George Pickens. I think this guy's going to be an animal and is absolutely going to carve up teams this year. I like Kenny Pickett a lot and what we'll see from him. Uh, I'm excited about the Steelers team this year. And I don't say that lightly because I'm not a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, but I like what they've done uh, there. AP poll came out this week. Georgia number one, little surprise there. 60 of the 63 votes. Mike, who is a team that is too high in the AP poll? And who is a team that, in your opinion, is too low in the AP poll? Oh, man. I'm going to, you know, I I think the AP poll voters did a pretty good job in the top 10. I'm just not drinking this Texas Kool-Aid. I'm just not drinking it. I know they, they got a lot of guys back and I all guess no breaks. But this is a team that did not score an offensive touchdown at home against TCU last year. I'm going to repeat that. The TCU team George put 65 on held the Texas offense out of the end zone in Austin, Texas. I, I'm just, I'm not ready to drink the Kool-Aid. So, and they're at number 11. I, you know, Georgia one, Michigan two, okay, Ohio State three. I'm on board four, Alabama five, LSU. So far, so good. You know, you're a little bit more bullish on Penn State than I am. It's possible if they beat Ohio State or Michigan, then they're top 10 team more than likely. I've got, I've got Florida State higher. I'm one of those guys. Like, I think Florida State is going to be the college football playoff. I think Florida State's going to beat LSU in the opening week. I'm a seminal backer right now. I believe in Florida State. I think you're going to see him in the playoff. Who knows? Maybe Georgia will play Florida State. Wouldn't that be a lot of fun? I'm not sure about the West Coast. You know, USC, you make a good case. You bring up a good point, but this is year three with Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley. You know, Washington, I, I know Michael Penix. I spent some time with him. I like that story, Connor. I just don't know enough about – the rest of Washington football. I mean, they must be pretty good. They beat Dan Lanning and the Ducks last year. Um, so they must be pretty solid. Um, but I, I suppose Texas is my overrated team. Um, I, also, Tennessee at 12, I, I'm not a believer. I, I'm just not a believer. I don't believe Tennessee. Uh, I don't think they're going to sustain. I don't think they're going to win 11 games again. Um, not not drinking that Kool-Aid. I'm probably, I think Oregon's low at 15. Again, I'm a Dan Lanning guy. You know that. I think Oregon's going to find a way and, and ruin it for everybody. I think they're going to win the Pac-12 this year with one loss. Teams that are too high for me, Florida State and LSU, I think both are actually a little bit overrated uh, over the course of the season. Um, I think LSU is going to win that week one game, but I, I do not trust either of those teams to finish in the top 10 at the end of the season just yet. And a team that I think is too low, I actually think Washington at 10 is too low. I think that team's going to win the Pac-12, and they're going to get into the college football playoff. You mentioned Michael Penix. They bring back their top three receivers from last season. I think this is a really talented team. And, and you know, the schedule, it is a little difficult for them. Uh, their season comes down to, I think, a four-game stretch where they have USC, Utah, and Oregon. And two of those games are on the road, but they do get USC at home. And that's a tough place to play up there in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. So I like Washington as a team that I think is going to finish higher than 10th in the AP poll there. And so that is going to wrap things up for us here on Dog Nation Happy Hour. Once again, presented by Marlowe's Happy Hour every weekday from four to six. 
have a variety of specials that you can try. It's fun to mix it up with the happy hour menu, whether it be the Nashville hot chicken. Uh, don't be afraid to try some of the drink favorites, whether it be the pineapple mojito or the new apricot sour, a favorite whiskey treat. We've got the firecracker deviled eggs, the kettle chips. We've got so many wonderful options to choose from at our friends at Marlowe's, uh, yeah, at Marlowe's Tavern. Make sure to check out their happy hour from four to six. It's fun to mix things up with the happy hour menu, even with your usual favorites. I know mine is the Royale with cheese. Uh, I'm sure Mike has plenty of favorites there as well. So this has been the Dog Nation Happy Hour presented by Marlowe's Tavern. Make sure to check them out. And again, happy hour, four to six every weekday. Uh, for Mike Griffith, my name is Connor Riley, and this has been a Dog Nation production.